I was chatting to Pete Rizzo yesterday and we were talking about narratives. Every cycle has a narrative. And I I would like to see over the next couple of years lightning to be another narrative and get back into the spending. And I know some people like hodl, hodl only, but um, we have the lightning that we're there to be used. We want it to be used. I, I'm a big supporter in the idea of uh, promoting that over the next few years and really pushing the lightning network because I got, a, I got to see a glimpse of it in El Salvador. And I always talk about this one specific trip because I've been five, six times now. And what used to happen, I'd get to the airport and I'd land and I'd get out a couple of hundred dollars and head down to Zonte and that would pretty much last me. Um, and then I think on one of the trips, I uh, didn't get the money out of the airport. I can't remember why. And um, But I went to the Bitcoin ATM in Zonte and uh, sent some Bitcoin and withdrew some dollars. And then the last trip I went, I didn't do either. I just... Everyone, everybody supports Lightning. So I didn't have any dollars. I didn't need any dollars. Whether I went to dinner or whether I went to the shop or whether I went for a beer, whatever I did, I could pay for everything on the Lightning Network. And that was super interesting because it just, as an experience, it was like, this is so easy. I don't even have to think. I just turn up. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. How was the user experience when using it in that, that amount? Brilliant, because in that experience, all I'm buying are things that are... Um, less than $100. So if I'm going to Enzo's for coffee, I'm spending $10, $15. Even if I'm going for dinner, I'm still only probably spending $40, $50. And there's nothing I'm buying over $50, right? So the experience was great. And, and you know, even when we went into the capital, when we would go to Starbucks and try, I mean, Starbucks was seamless. McDonald's was a little bit harder. But I was thinking when I got back to the UK, I was like wondering how this would be the same or even here in the US, but my, my bigger problem here is my average purchases on the cars are going to be higher. Like you can go to a dinner and you could spend three, four hundred dollars five hundred dollars $500, and I'm not sure the Lightning Network is going to be able to handle that every time. You know, I've, I've had history uh, difficulty in the past with certain transactions. When you start to get near $100, $150, $200, it gets a bit harder. But the experience there, it just worked. Everywhere I went, pretty much accepted it. And I didn't have to think about, I just didn't have to think about money. And I loved it. And that was a real game changer for me in terms of, you know, thinking about how the Lightning Network works and how useful it is, is that traveling from place to place and having that one single currency and not having to think about exchange rates or, you know, not having to think about anything. Like even, because it is quite expensive as well when you're traveling to withdraw money or make payments on your card. Each time you're making a payment, you're paying one to two dollars just in a fee. And that's a fee I'm paying on top of the fees, the middleman fees we've talked yes. about in the past. So you have to think about, oh, well, I should withdraw some money. That's why I used to get a lot out at the bank it, to begin with, just to avoid all those fees. But it was, I think it was brilliant. I loved it. And I think you put a, you put a dollar stable coin on that network. That's a massive game changer. That's a huge combination because it's both a way to transfer Bitcoins around. That's obviously the initial yeah. purpose. But then, yeah, in theory, you can then put other assets on it. And so we've already seen that uh, to some extent with Strike. Yep. Uh, basically, the, the key insight that you can use this as a, a payments network in addition, even if you don't care about holding the unit. You can you can convert fiat currency to Bitcoin, send it over Lightning, convert it back to fiat currency. And yes, if you, if you make a stablecoin version of that right on Lightning, you can make that potentially even more seamless. And... To your point about liquidity, so liquidity is one of those things that's getting better over time. If you try to, you know, the the it can't, you know, Lightning was initially proposed white paper back 2015, 2016. Original implementations came out early 2018. If you tried to send money super early on, there were much fewer connections and they were smaller connections. It was actually pretty hard to send a meaningful dollar value reliably. Um, but then years of more people joining the network. Channels, channels getting bigger and more connected makes the higher and higher payment thresholds work. And I think one of the reasons it's dismissed is because it's so small and, and quote unquote slow growing. It's not like you can just flip a switch and then you have this like billion dollar DeFi casino, right? It's, it's this slow grind up. And I think that's why it's, it's not super interesting to someone who makes, want, wants to make money very quickly or who doesn't look at things that are worth less than a billion dollars. And I think that's a big mistake because the way this is designed, there's no other way than to start slow. Yes. Because it's channel by channel. And at first, it's, it's, it's well, one, it's the developers themselves. And then two, it's like people that really want it to work and that will like help make it work 
you know, they're using it to build it out. It's like people using machetes to cut through the jungle to make like the initial roads so that later like better roads can be built kind of. So it was built channel by channel painstakingly. And after two, three years of that, now we're kind of at critical mass. You said you can do, you can do $50, $100 payments, no problem uh, on a frequent basis. Yeah. And that's, that wasn't the case, you know, two, three years ago. And I think when we look five years out, I think we're going to see much bigger payments become the norm or become like uh, sending much bigger payments will be much easier in the Lightning Network. I just pulled up that um, arcane research and they said in the last year, the number of payments has doubled and the value of those payments up by over 400%. So it's so what, what's the average value of a, does it say? It doesn't say that. Huh. I don't, I think it's, it's quite hard to glean some of that information, I think. Yeah, so the interesting thing about um, the El Salvador thing is that uh, it went from using Lightning being a novelty to being a uh, uh, benefit to me. So, for example, we, you know, in my football club, we we accept Lightning payments. You can come in, you can buy your beer or your entry fee and Lightning, and, and that's cool, and we accept it also on our website. But I... Most of the times when I see an option on a website to buy some of Bitcoin, I'm a bit like Danny. I, like, I don't always want to do it because I want to hodl my Bitcoin. I want to spend my fiat because, it, because otherwise I, I would be converting that to Bitcoin. So, um, but the thing about what happened in El Salvador is actually it was the ease of use that made me not even think about using fiat. It made me happy to use the Lightning Network. It wasn't just a novelty going, oh, you know, because we have people come down the club and they want to spend their Bitcoin. And sometimes I think it's maybe a novelty yeah, you know, maybe other reasons is for their personal privacy, but you know, when it gets to the point where it just makes life easier, um, that I'm going to use it more. So that was a that was a really interesting experience. You should probably go and see it sometime. I would like to. Yeah, and, and to that point about you know using it, it's one of those things like people in developed countries they they never wake up and well they most of them don't wake up and think I have a payments problem. It's really hard yeah. for me to make payments. In the developing world, that's that's generally a much bigger problem. Yeah, and Lightning opens up interesting things, and Bitcoin in general opens up interesting things. I mean, if you're a programmer in a country, and you you can now get international payments directly from them without going through that their country's banking system. It's basically peer to peer finance, mm. and then they have a, a unit that is hard. It is harder than their local currency. So one, it basically it connects global labor, global work, global productivity in a way that that didn't exist before. Um, and number two, I think that. It, this is where, in many cases, store of value will precede medium exchange in the sense that, you know, I, I, also, I also, just like you, don't necessarily want to spend a ton of Bitcoin. I want to hold Bitcoin. Mm. I'd rather spend dollars because they, they go down over time. Um, and when we add things like there's frictions, right? So there's, there's you know, technically if you, if you spend Bitcoin of Lightning Network, you, that's a taxable event. You, you've basically now have tax, uh, capital gain taxes to pay. And they're, they're challenging to record and it's just, that's, you know. I just don't. It's, I don't care. Honestly, I don't. <laughs> Probably shouldn't say that. I know. I just don't care. Like I'll, I'll, I'll have that argument with, uh, I'll have that argument with the tax man in the UK. It's just like I'm not going to record every one of these, and I'm just not doing it. Like just I'll find me. I'll pay the fine. It'll be quicker. Fuck that. I'm not doing it. I'm not. That's why I think the bill from Senator Gillibrand and uh, Senator Lummis was great because they want. I think it was six hundred dollars. They said so. it, which seems like a good number. And also, they've been in the clause for inflation, which I thought was smart. Yes, and, and I think these are good for adoption over time. And I think it's also that when someone has a small percentage of their money in Bitcoin, they don't necessarily want to spend any. There are people that have been in Bitcoin for five, ten years, and Bitcoin's a pretty big percentage of their net worth, and then they want to spend some of it. And the more merchants that accept Bitcoin. That strengthens the network even for people that are not spending it because it makes it more censorship resistant. If 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 theoretically no one accepted Bitcoin and all we could ever do with our Bitcoin is go back to an exchange and put it back into fiat currency, that wouldn't be super valuable because you know if governments didn't want that, they could just cut off exchanges. Uh, you saw in Canada, I mean, you know, if certain addresses are coming in, they can try to blacklist them. Mm -hmm. if, if you have a few points of conversion uh, as your only way to actually you know actualize that as money. Uh, that's not great. But if more merchants accept it, even for people that are just hodling it, it's inherently a more valuable network now because you have the optionality. Yep. You know, part, when you're holding Bitcoin, what you're holding is the optionality to one day spend it wherever you want without anyone's permission. And so the more permissionless and the more widely accepted that unit is, 
and it, it whether or not the merchant accepts bitcoins and holds them or if they accept bitcoins and use the software to immediately turn them into dollars or pesos or whatever that's fine the fact that you can go to countries around the world and directly spend your bitcoin makes that bitcoin more fundamentally useful i i also like the fact that bitcoin just grows at its own pace <laughs> you know that there's, there's not like a massive rush for bitcoin it's not like a you know if you have a uh, company and they've raised finance um you know, series A, Series B, every time they've got to spend that money. The idea is spend that money and chase growth. Grow as quickly and fast as you can. That just doesn't really happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin just grows its, it, at its own pace, but it does keep growing. Keeps growing. Yeah, when you look at Bitcoin-focused startups or Bitcoin-only startups, and yeah. you look at the broad crypto startups, Bitcoin startups tend to be very utilitarian. It's, it's a very you know low speculation to utility ratio, right? They're mostly about... How can we make better wallets? How can we make better payment solutions? How can we make you know uh, better user experience as money? Uh, and or you know that's the type of thing we're seeing more and more of. Where it's not you know mostly about leverage or your trading and things like that. It's about how to make Bitcoin better money. And money is one of those things where not everyone realizes they need permissionless money right now. Um, but I think more people around the world either either due to inflation they want inflation resistant money. That doesn't mean Bitcoin goes up the exact moment inflation goes up, but it means that over the long arc of time that the supply is not increasing at an arbitrary rate. So they want more of that. And then number two, they want to be able to spend money uh, with it, no one being able to say no to them. And, you know... Trudeau-resistant money. Yeah. But anyone resistant money. And, and it's one of those things, I mean, even people that say agree with that, if, if they like Trudeau, maybe they hate the next guy. Mm -hmm. And they don't want that next guy to have the power. So it's about, you don't want anyone to have the power. And in a world where peer-to-peer -peer money does not really exist. So, if, you know, prior to Bitcoin, prior to, prior to the technologies we have now, if I want to send money to a friend in Japan, how do I do it? I had the exact same problems. When we went out to do the Car Palace interview, um, we hired a local uh, cameraman to, to come and shoot the, the interview. And then afterwards, he sent me his bank details to pay him. And my bank could not connect to his bank. Every way we tried to send him money, they were just saying, like, because one of the things is, is like, most of the time when you send him money, like, domestically, it's really easy. Here is my sort code, and here's my bank account number in the UK. And then even internationally, sometimes you've got, you know, your IBAN number, whatever. But when you do some of these international payments, they have different formats for, say, addresses. So give me the address, and there's no clear consistent formatting and we couldn't get it to work we couldn't do it through paypal he actually got paid in bitcoin that was that was like one of the first times where i had to do it because of a banking problem yes and that's and that's a logistics problem and that's all sorts of problems and then it's worse if you're in an authoritarian country yeah and so that's why we see for example before he was arrested putin's opposition used to use bitcoin because his bank accounts were always frozen yeah. And then ironically, then then they go back and unfreeze the bank accounts because they're like, well, we'd rather actually see the money and see what he's doing with it rather than him going through Bitcoin. <laughs> so around the world, basically, you know, the Human Rights, uh, you know, Foundation uses Bitcoin quite significantly in their in their you know programs, and that's why they fund things like privacy techniques. Um, so it, it's basically having that censorship resistant payments technology is super valuable. And so going back to what I was saying before, if I wanted to send money to someone in Japan. I, I have to go through these permissioned entities. Even if it works, right? I, I'm going through permissioned entities, banks. You know, I have to. I go to my bank. My bank sends it to their bank. Uh, since it's international, central banks are implicitly involved. It's basically it's bank to bank to bank system. And other than like stuffing cash in an envelope or something like that, there's really no way to peer to peer send money. And with Bitcoin, now peer to peer money exists. And what's interesting about that is that opens up all sorts of, that's a Pandora's box for government regulators. That's why they're still str wrestling with this. Because if you're trying to do like regulations on who can send who to money to who, you only need to enforce it on banks. You know, in, in the United States, it's a few thousand entities. They're highly regulated. We, you know, it's easy to tell the banks what they have to do. You have to, you have to get this information. You can't send it to these sources, X, Y, Z. Uh, if this happens, report it to us every time. Whereas once technology exists that allows individuals to send money to other individuals, that's very hard for governments to block or enforce because the number of enforcement points are in the millions instead of the thousands. And so it basically is Pandora's box. And of course, a, a very, very, very authoritarian countries can try, 
But even then, it just happens. It's kind of like in Venezuela or other countries, you're not supposed to use dollars. I mean, in many countries, using dollars is illegal, and they still will use dollars. And similarly, in many countries, they'll say accepting Bitcoin is illegal. And they're like, well, yeah, I'm doing it anyway. So have fun like uh, telling millions of people they can't accept it. That, that's where it gets challenging to enforce.